It's uh, pretty obvious what Bitcoin is made for and I, I doubt that the creators or the creator <laughs> saw all this coming. You saw Bitcoin as a savings technology. The internet was kind of made for Bitcoin. You think you're late, but you're actually so, so early. Lightning is such a good example because it makes dealing with Bitcoin or Satoshi so easy and quick. Attack vectors on, on Bitcoin are interesting because uh, I have the impression that nobody really loves to talk about it too much. Um, and you said something that struck me. You said like even in the beginning when you first got into Bitcoin, uh, you saw Bitcoin as a savings technology. Uh, and also like I think the, the group members were like, oh, wow, that's like pretty soon you realize that's a savings technology. Why was this so, so uh, recognizable for you? Well, I, I said it uh, off the top of my head back then and uh, I thought about Why uh, and how did I actually get into it? Because it is quite a long time ago in, in Bitcoin uh, time. <laughs> uh, it was like 2013. And uh, my initial idea was that I didn't want to miss out on yet another tech wave. Because I had missed out uh, investing into the rise of the personal computer, I had missed out investing into uh, the rise of Microsoft and then later I uh, had missed out also on uh, the rise of the internet, on the smartphone and everything else. So, um, and I always wanted to, to, to find a, a good investment to take care of myself and the family. And uh, so my initial idea uh, was I, uh, I recognized the, the, that Bitcoin was something new that had not been there before. So my initial idea was, was uh, as, an, uh, as, a, as, a, as an investment in yet another high-tech uh, product, mm. which is only possible today and which was not possible earlier. And then later on, I, I dove into the rabbit hole and, and found uh, new thoughts. And, and uh, the, the, that was the, the thought I told you about uh, savings technology was only a couple of years later on. Oh, I love it. But it's, I think it's great to, to see it. Um, you also said like right now with, with the not an, yet another uh, adoption wave, um, you lived through the internet adoption life in 1990, 2000s. Yes. Uh, and I even had yesterday on Steve, with, he's like 75 year old and, and we really went deep into like how he was in the internet adoption. He was a network engineer even in that time. Uh, how did you live through the internet adoption? And interesting, how can you connect like internet and Bitcoin to it? Oh, well, uh, back then I was just a user. I was not a, any, a coder in any way. I am still a, a user, so I do not do any uh, coding or hardware design. I use uh, the internet for, for my work, which is technical uh, drawing, technical designing, steel detailing, mm -hmm. and for, for private stuff. And uh, back then I, I uh, lived through the internet adoption as a user. And so I grew along with it and I went through all the early stuff, the, Netscape browser and all that, <laughs> and uh, dial-in modems and the old stuff from the 1990s like everybody else. And um, concerning Bitcoin, I had uh, an interesting idea that came to me uh, a couple months ago that uh, when you look at the technical specification of the Bitcoin core, it has a certain uh, bandwidth requirement for the internet um, in order to work at all. So it can make connections to the, to the, to the network. And uh, the uh, internet bandwidth is um, like rising or doubling every 10 years or so. It's like growing exponentially. And back then when, when Bitcoin was incepted, uh, it's matched uh, the global available average bandwidth pretty perfectly. So the Bitcoin core The, the, the year came out uh, at about 2010, uh, matched the uh, available internet bandwidth. So that's uh, uh, so that makes me think today that the internet was kind of made for Bitcoin, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, wait, the, and this internet bandwidth, it's still doubling every 10 years? Uh, well, it's gonna, it's, uh, it's, I think it's gonna, I'm, I'm not a technical expert, but it did so in the past. Oh, okay. And yeah. uh, I don't know how long it, this is gonna, going to go on. It depends on technical developments. I have no part in, but, um, but that's pretty interesting. It's become know. pretty quick by, by now. When, when you think back to the olden days of streaming, things weren't possible or were lagging. Today you can stream every movie in high quality, for example.
And you even can download the movie in like, depending on your internet connection, like a few seconds or a few minutes and then mm -hmm. you have it offline even and you don't even have to stream it. It's pretty amazing actually. I remember those yeah. days where I have to download like a movie or a game or something like that and I have to wait like a day. Uh -huh, uh -huh, it's yeah. like click half an hour maximum and it's, it, <laughs> it is there. Yes, it's become so quick, amazingly quick. Um, where would you say um, are we now with Bitcoin adoption, especially when you can maybe compare it because internet adoption is like people have it in the head with 2000 with the dot com bubble, uh, then like there's Google uh, and all the things are coming, they were there before, where like if you had to put a year from the internet adoption to the Bitcoin adoption now, where would you say we are like 1995, 1997? Well, That's difficult to say because uh, Bitcoin is a grassroots thing, and um, the many other adoption cycles like uh, the computer or the smartphone phone they were driven by by large companies and centralized uh, big money. Um, but it's safe to say we are still pretty early because. Uh, Many people have heard of Bitcoin, but uh, not a lot uh, know a lot about it. Mm. And there's a, a lot of stuff happening, as I saw on the BTC Prague. There are lots of companies building hardware and software around this amazing thing. It's beautiful. And um, I, I can't pinpoint uh, at what f year uh, compared to any other uh, adoption we are, but I think um, maybe if we compare it to the internet uh, development, I'd say early to mid 1990s, maybe nine, yeah, like 1994 or something like that. Mm. 1994. I think it's really funny because uh, I always thought about like Bitcoin is more to the 2000s, but everyone that I uh, ask uh, uh, tells me something before 1998. Uh, like I always like, oh, maybe it's like closer to 1997, 1998, um, before we got uh, a huge boom in the dot-com bubble and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But everyone is actually more like, oh, no, 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 we're not that far in the Bitcoin uh, conversation. Uh, yesterday or day before yesterday, I heard we are right around the 1990s. Okay. Uh, we're really early with, with, with Bitcoin uh, because even the TCP IP protocol was like the layer three. And like, if you have Bitcoin as the base layer, we, we cannot even imagine what like will happen on like a third layer, fourth layer, where, mm -hmm. where we are going mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah. And we are still figuring out uh, the, the base layer now, uh, which is yeah. pretty, pretty soon. It's it's spectacular for me when you're like, you, you think you are early and you think you're late, but you're actually so, so early in, in, in Bitcoin. Well, yes, when you're in for a long time, it, it feels kind of uh, late <laughs> because you everybody knows the crazy moves uh, Bitcoin did in, in the early days. And um, yeah, it, it's, um, uh, it's, it's super exciting. So uh, early and late at the same time, but uh, maybe it's, it's never too late to, to get into the layer zero. I think the time is always good to get in there. Mm. Um, because the potential of, of Bitcoin is so great. It gives me new, new ideas every day. Like today, uh, now we're in Vienna and I had to, uh, to um, get some cash at the ATM machine. I had to get me a ticket for the local subway and I went to buy me a bottle of water and everywhere you have a different uh, card or you have to pay in cash, you have to pay in card and you, And, 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 and there's lots of different cards and, and different companies uh, wanting to partake in this business. And uh, if you had one standard like Bitcoin, it would be a lot easier. You, you would still have a lot of different apps like the wallet apps you have. Uh, but um, I think it would, be, uh, would make life a lot easier. <laughs> One protocol to rule them all, basically. And it's really yes. interesting also for me uh, when we talk about all those different cards, when, when we think about like spending digital euros, uh, every time we transact with it, there's like a, a massive fee to it. Like uh, the MasterCard takes a massive fee, you know, all, all the things, yeah. not, not as an end consumer, but uh, as, as a business and everything. Uh, so I think, I hope like, Uh, buying an Apple should not have like a 3% fee on, on, on there. It should be like be re really, really slow. And maybe then the bigger transactions later that we settle on Bitcoin or selling on, on, on mm -hmm. Lightning, uh, those should be like a smaller one. 
Oh well, the the fees. I think they are here to stay because uh, if you if you build a business around Bitcoin, you you have to live off something. And if it's a uh, Satoshi fee, uh, so be it. It's only fair. But uh, it's gonna depend on how high the fees are. If they are like sensible and low, it's it's gonna be cool. That that uh, there's not gonna be like a fee-less transaction. Nobody's gonna build a business around something they cannot take uh, any any fees from. Um, but I had an amazing uh, in, uh, experience with uh, with uh, paying with sets in a bar in Prague, and it happened re really lightning quick, as the network name says. It was it was it was so it felt so amazing, uh, just flashingly quick and a little bit of a fee, and and that would be so nice to have. Do you think the uh, or do you already see the the Bitcoin adoption going with like Lightning, maybe Fediment? Where do you see like this the scaling happening, or can we even see it to now? Oh, I, I see it happening. It's, it's, uh, like Lightning is such a good example because it makes uh, uh, dealing with Bitcoin or Satoshi so easy and quick. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went to that bar, I, I bought me a beer and I it was my first uh, Satoshi transaction for for something. Mm. For consumer, consumable, so I think it was a great idea to buy Czech beer with Satoshi's. <laughs> it was absolutely beautiful, worth it. And uh, the the bartender said sure, uh, and he handed me his uh, pa his tablet with a QR code. I scanned it, and that was it. It, it happened mm. like within a second. And that's uh, that's that's clearly adoption because it it, it, it takes uh, a place on a on a higher uh, level protocol which is so much quicker and I still have to get into the Fediment or the, the Noster and all the other stuff I saw on the BTC Prague. I have not found time yet to get to dive into this stuff that's happening there. So there's a lot of stuff happening that's very, very interesting. Like Fediment is super interesting for communal use of, of Bitcoin. That's super cool. And uh, but I have to dive into it yet. <laughs> yeah. And it's also interesting for me to see where the Bitcoin adoption Uh, is taking place and how long it will take to hit certain milestones like we have now like the first bitcoin transaction was the bitcoin pizza day mm -hmm. uh, it's like a while back it was like 2010 i think uh, it was like it was really early on in the in the, in the internet days yes uh, and now not quite sure when it was but yeah, it was pretty early when yeah. it was 10,000 uh, bitcoin for one pizza yeah, yeah that's, that was, that, that's really early <laughs> like 10,000 bitcoin Uh, imagine holding on to them since then. <laughs> But yeah, uh, this 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 thing uh, of having uh, Bitcoin payments uh, right now it's possible. We have some applications. Um, some Bitcoiners use it at, at like Bitcoin conferences. They they maybe ask like the local bar or, or a restaurant if they accept it. Yeah. Some pay maybe even weekly or monthly with it. Um, maybe some are in El Salvador and those places do actually pay almost everything with it. Mm -hmm. So we, depending on where you live and, and what you do with it, um, you, you have a different uh, view on where Bitcoin as a medium of exchange, as a currency is. Um, when do you think, I mean, it's pure speculation, but it's still fun to talk about it. When do you think we hit this this milestone where we, It's it's kind of normal we have Bitcoin as a currency also. You mean in the future when we're going to hit the milestone in the future? Yeah. Oh, that's a difficult one. It's um, uh, it it de depends on so many things on on the will of of people in general to accept it, and the will of businesses, and uh, that depends on the government regulations you have. So it's gonna be different by country. The the mm. quicker uh, a country is, uh, giving Bitcoin a proper legal status and being supportive of it, is, is gonna make the difference. Mm. That's my opinion. Yeah. It's, uh, the, the, and the people will follow when when the when the regulations are there, or they will go first, and the regulations will have to follow one way or the other. It's both happening. So. There's some countries where the people are very pro Bitcoin and then regulations is lagging behind and you have to kind of force it into the government <laughs> or talk uh, to the government. And the government will see that that pe Bitcoin people are like way smarter and uh, than average or uh, have maybe better better attitude and, and more serious attitude. And uh, that helps uh, a government adapt or get the foot into the door of the government. 
or you have it the other way around, like uh, like in El Salvador when when the president does the first step, and so it's it's gonna happen uh, different speeds in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I also think so. I mean, we already see it uh, where there are almost no transactions in in some countries and a lot of transactions in, in some others like El Salvador, and Nigeria. Uh, mm -hmm. already a lot yeah. of grassroots movements coming also an interesting yeah. question to that uh, you mentioned before Bitcoin is a grassroots movement um, yeah. and uh, this is like I, I love I love that that Bitcoin actually comes up from from uh, from uh, small like we call it plebs uh, and then they and then they drive Bitcoin adoption uh, but now more and more like with, starting with 2020 we had micro strategy now more and more public companies coming in even El Salvador with Nebukele it was like a top down thing mm -hmm. now we have the Bitcoin ETF and all this institutional money coming in uh, two things that are really interesting for me like first of all like how different is the Bitcoin community now to when they, in the early days when you were around uh, and the second one is like is it is it still like a grassroots movement or is it like becoming more and more institutionalized more and more as a top town that people kind of like ha have to take it because uh, the, the 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 asset managers put it in every fund and mm -hmm. you, when, you, when you invest in S&P 500 you have it uh, well b back in the day uh, the um, I, I uh, was not part of any uh, Bitcoin community. I was uh, aware that um, <laughs> in 2013, when I was new to Bitcoin, it was uh, in the public opinion only used by drug dealers on uh, Silk Road <laughs> or gamblers or nerd money. So there was a community of, of hackers and devs like on GitHub or wherever those guys uh, are. But I never was a part of that because I don't do any software development. So I was pretty much on my, on my own. And, um, and then I, 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 uh, I went into Bitcoin and, uh, and held on to to most of it, <laughs> made a couple of mistakes during investing. And um, well, to, today, what was the question again? Where where the where was this going? Yeah, like for, uh, especially when you have the comparison from now to then. Uh -huh. uh, back then, as you said, it was just like hackers or maybe some some finance nerds that actually paid attention, uh -huh. uh, or people in the cryptographic community who are like, oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting, peer to peer uh -huh. transactions and, and Bitcoin. But now you have MicroStrategy, you have the Bitcoin ETFs, you have all those those really big wallets mm -hmm. in there. Uh, and I'm just wondering now there's like, even like when we have, for example, the S&P 500, everyone that's invested in the S&P 500 has some exposure to Bitcoin because Tesla has Bitcoin and MicroStrategy might also be soon in the S&P 500. And then yeah. like everyone has indirect access to the Bitcoin. Uh, with ETFs, it might come in pension funds. It might come if in under in mm -hmm. other products. So it might actually be that someone really hates Bitcoin, but they still have it because they have some ETF or some some fund uh, uh, investing, and it kind of comes top down from from the things. Yes, yes, it's uh, it's uh, in the beginning it was it was grassroots, like completely bottom up before there were any companies investing. Of course, it was just. Uh, you and holding on to a Bitcoin and your diamond hands or lettuce hands, whatever you had, <laughs> and the other uh, coins around. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a gamble. It was a Wild West thing. And uh, with the inception of, of the ETF, uh, it was, or maybe even earlier, it became pretty obvious that uh, Bitcoin was becoming interested for, uh, for governments and in large money uh, of corporations. Um, but it still has its grassroots element because all those uh, uh, companies I saw on uh, on the BTC Prague, they are obviously uh, existing because of Bitcoin and are small, new founded companies, growing uh, young people, very spirited, very creative, very positive. So all the uh, landmarks of, of uh, uh, growing, healthy, young companies. And that's grassroots to me because mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not, maybe they have some sponsors or, or, or business, bigger ideas, but you never know. But 
I, I, I met a lot of, uh, of highly spirited people like the guys from Rower Town with the pirate ship. That was beautiful. And it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's such a, that's a, such a positive grassroots feeling that come, came to me on that BTC Prague. And on the other hand, um, it's, yeah, it's, uh, you, I think it's a positive thing that uh, big money and, 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 and governments are becoming aware of it because you need to have the environment, the legal environment uh, to, to build a Bitcoin economy. You, you need to have the taxes and the regulations and, and to, on, to order to, to sort that out, you need to have some kind of government. And uh, the big money investing into um, Bitcoin is troubling me a bit sometimes, like if you think about BlackRock or other big funds, because they could, of course, uh, use their stack to try and uh, manipulate the market like they do with everything else, like gold or what have you. It's all manipulated. It's all uh, part of this game. And uh, with Bitcoin, it's, there are so many theories out there that Bitcoin will always win, no matter how. I mean, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, like a, a, a company with a big stack of Bitcoin and malicious um, purpose could uh, do a large dump and um, you could play out a lot of theories what would happen then it would the Bitcoin would flow to to people like Michael Saylor who have a good attitude and uh, stack it for like a future purpose nobody knows maybe to release it on, on uh, upon the world on a, on a day in the future in order to so for everybody to benefit so it's uh, it's it's very very complex and I cannot foresee what is going to happen in the Bitcoin space or if, if Bitcoin can actually be harmed by very uh, rich actors with bad purposes. Yeah, that's, I think that's to the topic is in the Bitcoin community since uh, even the, before the Bitcoin ETF even started. Like uh, <clears throat> I can remember that like a year ago, it already started that topic of like, what if actually Bitcoin ETF happens, BlackRock comes in, they have a lot of money, uh, they came really quickly to like 200 or 300,000 Bitcoin. All the ETFs together have, I think, over a million Bitcoin uh, to, uh, accumulated. Important to note, those are not the, the company's ETFs, uh, company's Bitcoin. Those are from clients mm -hmm. uh, on their behalf, but still they control it or rather Coinbase controls them uh, because they are behind them. So I see some attack vectors, but I'm like... Over the long run, if you have your own Bitcoin, you have it in your self-custody solution where nobody can can get them. Um, they can try whatever they want. They can manipulate the price, of course, uh, mm -hmm. for over the long, over the short run, maybe even medium term. But long run, I feel like uh, the the price will sort each other out. Even if the gold price, I feel like um, they they can can do a lot more with gold. But over the long run, it still uh, will will do its 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 thing. I mean, gold is another piece because there's also then uh, the thing coming in with uh, the the supply of gold. Like when gold price comes up, people will start digging in the oceans and and, and try to find more gold and all those things. Yes, yes. Uh, but but the uh, attack vectors on, on Bitcoin are interesting because uh, I have the impression that nobody really loves to talk about it too much, and there are indeed a, a few uh, weak points that or possibly weak points that should be addressed more often. Um, yeah, the one thing is that that like big uh, actors with big money can can they have, like you said, like a million Bitcoin maybe now. And then there's also those uh, unmoved, uh, those long dormant uh, wallets or lost keys, mm. which also sum up to quite a su substantial amount. Yeah. So uh, Bitcoin could uh, theoretically inflate, so to say, in a, in a most unfortunate way when somebody uh, tries to strategically uh, move or dump his Bitcoin that have been dormant for like um, 15, 13 years now. That's also a possibility. Um, and that uh, we Bitcoiners or we early Bitcoiners or the, the community I know now and I saw it at BTC Prague and on the internet, we are a kind of a bubble with a bit of a religious attitude and a bit of nothing uh, can happen. And, and, and uh, that's 
you know, I'm 50, uh, over 50 years old now. And uh, something is always, something can always happen. Mm. Uh, but yes, Bitcoin is still the best thing to me that, uh, that um, the best monetary invention, at least, if not, uh, if not uh, even the dawn of a completely new age, potentially it is, but there will be many rocks in the way. With the Bitcoin that might be released, and I also thought about that actually. When when there's there are definitely a, a lot of Bitcoin lost over the years that will never yeah. be moved again. But there are also probably someone out there that has a lot of Bitcoin, like actually a lot of Bitcoin, and never moved them because they're like, oh no, I'm fine. I, I live yeah. good. Like I, I don't need to move them. I don't need to sell them. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. maybe if Bitcoin gets up to a million. He, he might be fancy himself and like, oh, let's, let's release, uh, I don't know, 20,000 Bitcoin today uh, be, because I, I would like to have, I don't know, this, this, this villa in, in Spain or whatever, mm -hmm. or like that island <laughs> with that amount of money. Um, so that's definitely an, an attack vector, even if it's maybe strategically, like not even uh, like I just want to sell my Bitcoin, but even like there's uh, some strategic partners in there that have a lot of Bitcoin. But is this attack vector for you a, a danger for uh, the long, uh, the, the short and medium term for the price action or might actually be a long term hurtful thing for Bitcoin? No, no, I don't think it's it's gonna it's gonna it might hurt the, the price. But that's that's actually not uh, what what Bitcoin is all about in the long run. Hmm. So currently the, the price action is, of course, it has to have a connection to fiat because of the proof of work. Mm. So, and uh, in the future, it uh, I think the monetary aspect will will become less uh, uh, when the the time chain aspect becomes more uh, obvious, and that uh, that the, the the blockchain is um, the safest way we will have in the future to store hashes and to uh, to trust. And that will become, I think, a, a big aspect of, of the Bitcoin, of the blockchain in the future mm. as, a, as, a, as a method to, to uh, store, uh, to safely store or witness important events, whatever you may have. There will be companies around witnessing like the, the notary uh, offices, will, which will um, uh, inscribe contracts into the blockchain, stuff like that. And um, then as a Bitcoin holder, you will uh, have access to this time chain and you can build businesses around that. And it, uh, it might completely decouple for, from money and become money itself, <laughs> which it is. <laughs> so it's uh, pretty obvious what, what Bitcoin is made for. And I, I doubt that the creators or the creator <laughs> saw all this coming. There, there are many examples. Uh, of people building things and developing things and bringing things into the world without having any idea what the world will make of it. And that it's, Bitcoin is such a, a great uh, universal tool that you can make everything out of it, that uh, you can, almost everything that you can possibly think of. It's also interesting, uh, you mentioned time chain, because I had recently with the time chain calendar founder, um, a, a podcast and he <laughs> brought something up to my attention that I never heard before but it's actually true Satoshi like in the white paper there's no one word for blockchain like it's not called once blockchain in the white paper and Satoshi co never called it uh, blockchain but he called it time chain mm -hmm. once in an early uh, email or writing of him so I was like what <laughs> it's, it's, yes, it's yes. not called blockchain there's this <laughs> blockchain coming from uh, and time chain and this uh, aspect of, of time stamping uh, certain events or maybe even documents or whatever happens is, is, is a massive thing like in uh, what was it Guatemala uh, where the uh, election was pro uh, audited by Bitcoin with uh, open timestamps I think it is the technology they used and uh, you can actually go uh, on the Guatemalan uh, uh, website and see mm -hmm. the uh, uh, voting ballots and then see the proof the timestamp of that document uh, with Bitcoin which mm -hmm. is fascinating for me that that's a use case that I think Satoshi Nakamoto probably didn't think about or maybe he did but uh, I, I don't know if he actually thought about like actually those kind of use cases 
If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup your security setup and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. Yes, yeah, that, that's, that's the use case I was thinking about too, because that, that uh, time chain aspect only came to me later on. Uh, on uh, like a year ago, I heard it. Uh, I heard Roman Rea talk about it, mm. and I was also like, "What is he talking about?" And he said, "Yeah, Bitcoin is a time chain." I I, I could not get my head around it, but but uh, it, it it sounded serious, so I uh, went and tried to understand it. And that's so uh, so amazing when you go down this Bitcoin rabbit hole. You always meet meet uh, new ideas. And you, you can sort them out. Some are rubbish, some are great because many people or high level Bitcoiners uh, entertain those ideas. And then it's maybe better you get a head around it. <laughs> and the time chain was such, such a fascinating idea. I, I still don't fully understand the technical detail. Uh, like, yes, superficially I understand with the, with the time coding and, and the block time and that. But um, uh, it's, uh, I understand enough of the time chain aspect that I think this is the actual core. Uh, Invention that they have a, a time chain that is distributed and, and trustless, so you can trust it and, and use it to encode and, and hash everything. Yeah, that's a, it's everything a, that can be communicated, like or money or contracts or what what have you. That's a major thing. Having something to rely on, uh, something that where history cannot be rewritten by the winners. Like there, there's this. Oh yes, that was something I was I was going to say, but I, I think that's a difficult one. Because um, it's yeah, that it was such an uh, entertaining idea to 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 encode the history into the blockchain, and um, but I cannot foresee if if, if history uh, once coded down couldn't be rewritten. Mm. It's you have to, yeah, it's uh, you have to have those uh, documents somewhere, uh, and because you cannot undo a hash in in the blockchain. <laughs> You have to have the original documents and, and to verify uh, the truth. And um, if they become, if some historical event happens and uh, the truth is actually in, about this event is encoded in the blockchain by a source you can trust and the document becomes lost and somebody else with malicious intent uh, replaces this version with the winner's version of history. Um, so it has some pitfalls, but I have not thought this completely through, but uh, it's pro probably uh, if there are smart people out there and figure it out, this, this documenting problem, uh, it's, it's a way to, to uh, follow the events of history and from now on until we have a hash collision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, it, I, th I think it's, there's still some some Oracle problems to it. Like someone has to uh, put the document uh, on the blockchain and hash it and uh, all, all the things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I released yesterday or the, for the viewers uh, a week ago, uh, a, a podcast with um, with the guy from Guatemala. I completely black now on the name uh, of him. Uh, completely for Carlos, Kalinios. Kalinios. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Kalinios. Uh, and, and he was talking about that, how he did it in Guatemala. And I was like, 
that's a really interesting concept, but it's not 100% clear how someone ca- could not swap the document so mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. could rewrite it somehow mm-hmm. uh, when, when those servers get maybe lost in history. Like short term, yes, I, I get it. Mm-hmm. But what if it's like in a thousand years? <laughs> And also then there's like, uh, really, really interesting because we have now all those video podcasts, we all have these written documents, uh, everything is digital. We have so many versions of like, uh, like maybe the Trump shooting is interesting because mm-hmm. how many theories were around, spinned around that? F- think about a person like a thousand years from now, looking back at like, all those podcasts and all those uh, theories and figure out like what was actually true. That's that's a difficult thing, I feel like. Yeah, it's, it's today there is no truth anymore. You cannot trust anything you see on the web because uh, I, I saw the Trump shooting. It was like the, the most insane thing I've seen in a very long time. If you think about it, it's it's completely uh, unthinkable that such a thing could happen. Mm. And and then you have those uh, eyewitnesses. Uh, eyewitness videos of the actual event of people warning the police of the shooter on the roof. And what if those were fake? What what if those eyewitnesses were actually uh, agents? And you know, you, there is no no way to um, to know what happened if unless you were actually Donald Trump standing on a podium. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I mean, even for him, it's it's hard, like because uh, he, he only know like, oh, I, I got hurt and I'm now, now down. Uh, like even he does not really know like where, where was the shooter actually coming from? Are there secret service agents telling me the truth? Yeah, mind blowing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so so how do we find truth then? How do we find truth? Um. Yeah, well, we have the technical means. It's it's consent. It's uh, it's um, in in the Bitcoin space. It's obvious how we we do it. Uh, we agree. The, the network agrees on a on a on a on a hash on on a, on a version of the blockchain. And if it doesn't, there is a fork. So that's that's a technical way to to establish truth. But um, uh, there, there is no, there is no, there is no, no general truth uh, in, a, in a philosophical sense or something that we could talk about because uh, on some things we we might agree, so it's true for both of us, and on some things we might have different views. Then you have your truth and I have mine, and, and I share my truth with other people. So that's it's it's just a philosophical idea and and and, and the technical development we have now. Uh, um, shows that we, we, I wonder if we have a need for truth anymore. Because when you realize you, you cannot trust anybody but yourself, and, and you don't have to, uh, you you uh, you don't um, need truth. Even my my children don't speak the truth to me all day, <laughs> and and uh, begin begin to imagine what people I do business with or friends tell to me. It's uh, we, we we people are we, we are lying by by nature or by uh, because we're used to it uh, sometimes. And then truth is a, is a philosophical concept. It it's it can be uh, established technically, but uh, but 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 not philosophically. There will always be debate. And, and if you if you uh, in today uh, we have uh, we know a lot more about the world and the universe and and truth tru- tru- truths that have been for a long time that have been held by religious leaders uh, have uh, become transparent as as lies and tools to manipulate people. So truth is also a dangerous thing because it's being used as a as a tool to to manipulate and control people. Mm. So I'm no fan of truth or religious. Uh, dogma stuff like that so truth is a bit of a difficult concept for me <laughs> i don't embrace it that much for me too i i i have this weird objection in me growing if someone says the the phrase the fact is like i'm like <laughs> how do we know that is a fact like how, how do we know that's the truth i feel like always like um when someone claims that that's the truth and that's the fact um it's it's, it's really hard and I, I love i had yesterday a twitter space actually and we talked about uh, and someone asked me like uh, oh how do you explain someone what's bitcoin is and, and and if he should invest his money in bitcoin yeah. and i was like I, I don't tell anyone to to buy bitcoin i i want 
people to understand they should learn about it they should educate themselves about it and they should yeah. dive deep into the technology and then make themselves a, a, a picture of what is bitcoin and is it fitting in my life i i, I would never tell you look, buy bitcoin Mm -hmm, I, I, I would never tell uh, even in my family uh, I'm very defensive when it comes to Bitcoin uh, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm never bringing the topic even up in my family if it comes up I, I'll, I'll give my two cents to it uh, as, as I see it as a responsible as a Bitcoiner uh, to, 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 to give it and then some somebody might come around and say like oh Robin how do I how can I buy it and then what's the process and then I, I help them with like buying and, and self custody and stuff like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I would never tell somebody that Bitcoin is the truth and buy it because I don't know like I think Bitcoin is the truth I yeah, think yeah. Bitcoin is the best thing but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, why should I claim the objective truth on the world well yeah it's a it's a it's a it's a interesting idea it's a great great idea Robin because I also think about orange pilling people should I do it and when if yes how do I do it or should I not um If I decide to not do, then I, I feel like a bit of a coward because, uh, you know, you have uh, as a Bitcoin, I think, or I sometimes feel that, that responsibility to make the world a better place. When you see the potential, you, you see the light and you, of course, want all the world to use Bitcoin. It's, it's like uh, the, the Holy Grail or the, the, the Stein der Weisen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, And uh, so that's, uh, but, but there's, uh, yeah, there's no way you, you, you can force Uh, Bitcoin on people or talk people into it because uh, in, uh, the, the point when you become convinced of Bitcoin uh, does not come in the beginning. It becomes when you're a couple of years or a few levels down the rabbit hole, which takes time. Mm -hmm. So I heard a lot of people say it takes hundreds or a thousand hours and, until you understand Bitcoin. And I myself, I'm by the uh, YouTube and other content I consume. Uh, by the podcasts I listen to, by the videos I watch, by the X comments and stuff I read, I'm easily uh, way over a thousand hours in, in Bitcoin and other crypto. So, <laughs> and uh, it only dawned to me uh, lately when, when the governments and the big pension funds and such became serious and, and, and people like Michael Saylor. So I think my Michael Saylor is such an important, uh, such an important figure in the Bitcoin space because he's like an evangelist who gives us those those uh, central or important ideas like like the need to know like don't sell your bitcoin all those great ideas and uh, he distills his his deep uh, knowledge and he's a strategic master and he's, he distills what he knows into the speech he gave at the btc prague which is only the, the very surface so everybody gets the message I, I, I and love that's that so great to have this guy that that he is there and gives us those those milestones in order to Uh, that when you're in doubt, should I orange pee people or not? Should, what should I do uh, in, in what situation? And, and that's so, so great that he's there and gives us those, those way marks along the journey. What was your favorite thing uh, from, from his Bitcoin Prague speech? Everything. I was in the second row and saw him live. I got uh, up early to see him and uh, it was, um, I wanted to see this man live and, and feel the vibe and, and see what, it's all, what he's all about. And, Oh, I, I cannot recall the whole the whole speech was 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 great. Mm. I would have to to look back what 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 was it twenty one uh, Bitcoin yeah twenty one rules of Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was a great speech because it was so comp comprehensive yeah. and uh, with so many Easter eggs and then links to pop culture like the Matrix and such yeah. and and uh, it's actual philosophy and uh, it was it was very deep and very comprehensive at the same time so that's a way that Michael Saylor can put things he can put things in a way that that people can understand who have no uh, no technical uh, idea of Bitcoin but more of a gut feeling about it who are, who are interested in and want to uh, to see what it's all about I, I had him uh, so he is an evangelist yeah he's an absolute and really good one in that yeah. sense and I, I had him uh, on the podcast four hours after his speech like four or five hours after he was on Bitcoin Prague he was actually uh, on my podcast uh, so we recorded for the podcast podcast came out like a week later uh, and I asked him what his favorite rule out of 
his 21 rules are. Okay. And his favorite rule is the spread Bitcoin with love. And he went oh, deep. Oh, yeah, in. that was a good one. That was a, an amazing one. Yeah. Uh, and I, I really was then after that, like even a week after that, uh, someone asked me um, a crypto channel has like a lot of meme coins on there. They're also talking more about Bitcoin, but they're also talking about all the altcoins. Yeah. And they were asking me, hey, do you want to speak on, on our panel? And I was like, I usually say no to that. Like, I, I don't want to affiliate myself to do altcoins. But I was like, if we really want to spread Bitcoin as, as far as possible, we have to take every possibility to uh, talk with the people and spread Bitcoin. And in there, there was one guy who uh, has also his own <laughs> own meme coin, and right. you you could feel it. He wants to sell it. And oh it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, was yeah. really toxic against oh, the Bitcoin yeah. maxis, and he said um, words that I don't even want to take in my uh, in my mouth against Bitcoin maxis, against Bitcoin in general. Uh, and I, in that moment, Marcus Seller was really in the back of my mind. It's like, spread Bitcoin with love. Like, mm. uh, be that one person that is, even though there is someone yelling at uh, a group that you affiliate with yourself, um, be kind, be be loving and be respectful of, of that person still. And uh, I got, I think, five or six messages after that saying, Thank you for staying level-headed. Thank you for being a, a kind person in that chat and not playing by these toxic rules. And I think that's really important. Uh, even if someone in your life gets like, oh, wow, Bitcoin is just for criminals. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. Like, be, be loving with that. Be respectful of that. And I feel like that's a way better approach. And Michael Saylor went on like 20, 25 minutes to explain mm -hmm. uh, with, with sales, with, with how we how we can actually get Bitcoin in the mass market and everything in the podcast. I, I love that segment a, a lot and I could go on and, and tell, tell too much about it. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, spread Bitcoin with love. That There's a hidden truth in it. It's... it's, it's uh, But it feels natural to and good to uh, to spread Bitcoin or as to say to to buy something with sets. So uh, I noticed when I bought my first beer with sets in Prague, it felt so much more satisfying than buying it with fiat. And I think that's what Michael Saylor is saying that you spread Bitcoin with love mm -hmm. when you make transactions and you 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 spread good vibrations and, and get something back with the product you buy for it. So that's uh, yet another layer of, of, the, of the protocol, <laughs> maybe sub-zero. The sub-zero level is love. And uh, I, I thought, well, I think uh, I call Bitcoin now the orange love machine. Oh, I, I, I saw, saw that handle of yours also. Yes. <laughs> And I, it, ca it came to me, I think, even before Michael Saylor's speech. Mm -hmm. so, so that love thing is such a, a core... Uh, element of, of the of the grassroots uh, Bitcoin people mm -hmm. and it's probably way different uh, an attitude towards uh, Bitcoin as uh, big big money companies have but maybe they will learn from it I am um, but yeah spread Bitcoin with love absolutely worked in Prague because everybody had this loving vibe I met people from all over the world And it, it, it was not uh, it, was, it was not a techie or a financial uh, conference. It was actually uh, so much love in there mm -hmm. because everybody loved to be there and loved what they did there and loved to meet people from all over the world. So there was a lot of love in the air, <laughs> a yeah. lot. I, I even had one podcast where we compared the the hippie movement, the, the loving movement, uh, a little bit with the the Bitcoin uh, movement uh, because oh, it's, yeah. it's 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 such an It's such a nice experience. Like you get addicted to Bitcoin conferences. Uh, I had this year to really emotionally step back and focus on the podcast, focusing like getting the podcast on, yeah. off the ground and not be every week at a Bitcoin conference all around the world because that's honestly the thing that I really want to do. <laughs> like just go from Bitcoin conference to Bitcoin conference and meet with everyone. Um, but I also want to contribute something and not just uh, 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 contribute something to society and contribute something to, to Bitcoin. Um, and, and so the, the podcast is really important for me to, to do something for Bitcoin. And I love uh, also speaking with the people. Mm -hmm. um, but getting it off the ground is, is the one thing that why I cannot go to all the Bitcoin conferences this year. Yeah. And I think next year I will be at 
like maybe 10 or maybe 15. Oh, uh, wow. I would love that. There are so many great ones that I missed out this year. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I was uh, BTC Prague was my first one oh. ever. And uh, so and since it's the biggest and most important one in Europe, I, I absolutely wanted to go there. And, yeah. But I, I never expected it to be that good. I expected <laughs> a lot. Uh, but not that that much love and positivity and, and how well this whole thing was produced and organized is so professional. Yeah. And I had, a, I had a great time there. And uh, yeah, a lot of beer. <laughs> I'm, I'm already looking forward to the, to the next one. <laughs> yes, me, me too. The, it's like the best beer in the world. And I say, I say that as someone coming from Germany, they make yeah. the best beer uh, out there the Czech people and uh, they, they had you could buy tap beer on the on the conference um, with uh, Satoshis and that was that was great beer for a great asset. <laughs> <laughs> by, the, by the way, for, for everyone also for, for you, if you want to buy early, 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 early tickets, they are already available and you can even okay. buy them already now with uh, discount code Robin. I think you get 10% off or something like that. Oh, cool. Uh, so like, uh, I think the Bitcoin Brack uh, organizers hit me up like two days after the conference and mm -hmm. they said like, hey, for the next conference, your ticket code is already <laughs> renewed. Uh, so they are... I got a really an, an, an behind the scenes look uh, on all the Bitcoin Prague things because they were sponsors. I talked with them uh, and they are so professional. They oh, yes. are so well organized. Uh -huh. um, they are so on the topic. Um, I, I loved it from the beginning, beginning to the end. And I will 100% uh, sponsor, like um, uh, um, advertise for them also next year, mm -hmm. closer to the event, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they are an amazing. How, how was the conference in, in general for you? Oh, it was, it was, it was beautiful. I, uh, I was in a couple of speeches. And uh, of Michael Saylor's uh, was one I followed completely and then maybe one or two more. But uh, mostly I was around in the, in the expo, talking to people mm -hmm. and or in the foyer, chatting with people, uh, drinking coffee, drinking beer. So it was like 90% uh, chatting, having fun, and or say 80% chatting, having fun, 15% uh, checking out the expo for hardware, software, and 5% panels. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, because I, I also, what I love uh, doing the most is like meeting people. And I will, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go again next year because I, I never had such an easy time meeting new people because I have this connecting topic and also so many uh, intelligent people. I have never met so many intelligent people mm. in, in one bunch. Uh, with a good attitude because there are lots of intelligent people but they think they're smart and, and they want to sell you stuff and in and, and a bitcoin conference like you said i i was there with a guy a uh, half a minute i i realized oh he's shilling something and then i went on <laughs> you, you you can you can smell such people when you're yeah. a bitcoiner and um uh, that that's such an amazing conference it was like yeah like the orange love machine at work <laughs> I love, I, I love orange love machine. Uh, yeah, but, let's get the term out there. Uh, I, I probably will uh, use it more in, in the podcast. I, I saw it yesterday uh, on, on some chat with, with like orange love machine. And then I was like, ah, interesting, orange love machine. And now you told me like, ah, that it actually makes sense. Like love is the basis for, for, for Bitcoin. I think the third ever guest said Bitcoin is love. This, this was for me the first time where I thought about it a little bit. Uh, but it's it's a fundamental truth. I feel like um, um, having Bitcoin when when it's connected to trust, it's like because it's trustless, you can trust that a transaction actually goes through when you send it. Okay. Uh, if you send it in a on a different uh, on the wrong address, which happened, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you, it's also that, that you can trust that you made the mistakes and you don't get it back. Like. It's, it's like an honest loving machine. It's, it's really cool. Was it the other Michael we talked about today? Uh, no, uh, it was the third ever podcast. It was... Oh, okay. uh, pff, um, oh man, I was not... Oh, never mind. Yeah, I unfortunately don't remember the name. It's it's uh, it's embarrassing if, if if I cannot remember the podcast names. <laughs> oh, you had so many guests. <laughs> I, 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 I hear you because I, I, I am not good at uh, remembering names. I'm... 
probably way worse than you at remembering names. <laughs> yeah, <I'm laughs> when, when I talk to people a lot, I, I remember them, of course, but uh, uh, sometimes people meet me and say, hey, Norman, and uh, uh, ah, yeah, we met because I, I'm good at remembering faces, but I suck at remembering <laughs> names. <laughs> and some people, they, they talk to me once, even drunk, and, and then they remember my name. It always embarrasses me a little bit, but but I got used to it, so it's just what it is. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it, it's it's a skill that I wish I could do also better. Like but you have you, you have so many contacts and and podcasts, yeah. and you meet like probably uh, three new people every day on the web mm -hmm. or in real life. So yeah, I think that's uh, actually a good average free because uh, you, you get to know, like I actively write people uh, when, they, when I see someone interesting for the podcast, then uh, more and more it happens that past uh, podcast guests or even people uh, that uh, I, I love and I trust, uh, bringing people on like, hey, he would also be great for your podcast. Like I get a podcast suggestions like probably like four times a week, something like that. Uh, so, so networking is something mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, is now actually completely automated on my part, just with the podcast because people bring up more people to me. Yeah, uh, yeah, networking. That's that's networking uh, in a technical sense and in a human sense. Yeah. Bitcoin. Co uh, connecting nodes uh, yeah. to each other. Yeah. It, it will be great. To so beautiful, isn't it? Im imagine. Bitcoin is actually successful in like, let's say 20 years. Mm -hmm. And you know all those people from the early days and you know they were there in like the early OG days. Mm -hmm. uh, because now people think they're late, but in 20 years, the people that come in right now, those are the OGs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's an amazing thing. Yeah, that's, uh, this OG term, it's so funny because I, I got called OG by... Uh, people who are who have been in for like five years yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they are already very savvy very smart people uh, who have a, like a financial background dealing with stocks and, and real interest and 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 and, and, and uh, playing back and forth with money and interest mm -hmm. rates and i have no mind for that that's not my game yeah. i could never figure out how this whole money game works some people are good at it and they can figure out how to uh, make money by lending it and then putting it into some funny circular business and, and winding up with more money than they put in. But that's not my game. I think the, the most important game in Bitcoin is buying it and then keeping it, <laughs> not, oh. not losing it. <laughs> but, but you also have to, to spend it mm. in order to make it work uh, as, a, as a money. Yeah. Um, Yeah, that's it's uh, it's. Uh, I think it's it's gonna regulate if you have uh, a, a big stack of Bitcoin and the value is going up because lots of people are holding, um, and if lots of people are holding and no one's transacting, then the value is gonna go down. So in in fiat terms, so it's uh, it's gonna it's probably gonna like balance somehow in uh, with holding and and, and spending. Because people will want luxury. Uh, but there's also a lot of people who follow this frugal theory that Bitcoin makes you more frugal because it's such a great asset. What, what else could you want? You, you wouldn't want to uh, trade your Bitcoin for a flashy watch or a fast car, maybe, because that's not better than having Bitcoin. <laughs> And uh, maybe... But maybe a farmhouse. <laughs> yeah, maybe something. So, yeah, yeah, of course, something with a yeah, farmhouse or... Yeah, s some things, yeah. So I, I think actually like um, every every Bitcoiner will start spending their Bitcoin at some point. Like if you keep on to your Bitcoin, your Bitcoin stack will probably outgrow your potential earnings that you have as an income mm -hmm. at some point um, because your stack is is uh, feeded by your income. So it, it has an advantage there. So at some point you will see, oh, I have like... I don't, let's say 5,000 euros coming in each month. Mm -hmm. But I have this 5 million uh, euro Bitcoin stack. I want to maybe um, uh, buy this this farmhouse or I want to buy, maybe someone also wants to buy just a flashy car. Like that, that that's fair game. So I think like no matter what it is in your head, everyone mm -hmm. wants to have have something. Uh, and and there are 
and even if it's just traveling the world traveling the world is expensive oh yeah like, absolutely like uh, you need money for, oh, yeah. for life oh yeah yeah traveling would is one of the things i would spend my yeah. <laughs> i would <laughs> and uh yeah uh, yeah a farmhouse great idea so i think only a small percentage of people actually are like Oh, I stacked and now I want to die with that stack or give it to my children. Yeah, that's um, something I think about what, 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 what is the best thing that Michael Saylor could do with his stack mm. and what's his purpose. Uh, maybe he's uh, going to release it unto uh, the world in his testament or maybe during his living days in order to orange peel uh, the, the world in, uh, in a certain way. <laughs> a big, or, big move of him. Um, yeah, but you, it would be a great experiment because uh, I think if you, if you get Bitcoin and you're not, uh, you don't have the spirit, you will spend it for, for, for stuff like a millionaire who wins in the lottery does. And with Michael's... Who is not used to a lot of, of cash. Yeah. And there are lots of people who have won the lottery and became suddenly rich and then... A year or two later, they were more broke than ever. <laughs> <laughs> and with Michael's situation, it's like he was already extremely wealthy before Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. So it's like he does not need his Bitcoin stack to fuel his lifestyle. Like whatever he wanted uh -huh. to afford, he could also afford without Bitcoin yeah, from his yeah. current income. So it's like interesting what he does with his stack. Um, uh, will be will be interesting. I, 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 I would love to see that he as the majority of his um, stack just released to the to the Bitcoin uh, blockchain and kind of burned forever and, and make it uh, make a donation to everyone. Well, yeah, maybe once his mission is done, but, but at, a, at a stage Bitcoin is now in its important phases and, and people to to grow. Yeah. And uh, I think that Michael Saylor is one of the most important people concerning that. 100 percent. Yeah. Um, really cool. Uh, we are already over one hour as a song. Already? That went fast. That went really fast. <laughs> we only got started, like like in Prague, <laughs> like in Prague, Robin. You know, we've been chatting yes. for hours on end and we only got started. We, we just scratched at the door of the rabbit hole, like like Gandalf scratched at, at Bilbo's door in Back End. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, when you come back again, let's make the second round. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'll be there and back again. Yeah. All right. Uh, perfect. But uh, before we have to end routine, we have this new question that I always ask my guests now. Uh, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Oh, great. Um, what can you learn from me besides Bitcoin? Oh, I hate that question. <laughs> Because that, that, that would require me to talk positively about myself, <laughs> which I, I don't normally do. I, I try to, to be uh, positive towards people as good as I can and have a good time with people. And uh, sometimes I, I want to, to spread uh, people uh, or positivity among, among people. So that's, uh, that's uh, not a, a learning thing, but an, an attitude thing that I can spread. So um, I always try to, to have a good time with people and, and that people who are with me have, have a good time too. And what, what you can possibly learn from me is that it's uh, always better to have a, a good uh, attitude and be positive. Uh, about everything than um, crying and complaining. <laughs> but that, that sounds a bit shallow, but uh, I, I have no really good way of, of putting what, what you can learn from me. I think that's a great uh, thing to learn from you. And I think you, we already saw that uh, throughout the podcast uh, with spreading Bitcoin with love and, and all, all, all that. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, before, Welcome. Uh, uh, now we come to the actual end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest uh, will be. Uh, and your question from the previous guest is, um, how did Bitcoin affect your life? Oh, that's a great question because it made my life a lot better um, as it is now. And it was also a, a nerve wracking journey because I've been holding Bitcoin for like 11 years now. And I realized that I'm emotionally attached to the fiat value of, of, of the Bitcoin. And so it was a, like a roller coaster journey, uh, a, a decade long journey 
with a lot of ups and downs. So, so sometimes it, it was nerve wracking, desperate. And, uh, but now my, my, my confidence has grown so much. So it, it has elevated me into a, like a, a exclusive circle of, of Bitcoin owners, so to say. And I, sometimes I feel that the days of my financial worries are finally over. So it made my uh, life in, in a financial way potentially uh, completely trouble free. But it also gave me a, a lot of confidence and a, a lot of relief that we actually actually live in times that such a thing as Bitcoin is possible. That, that we actually have to, because we are the first generation in humankind, have the technical uh, background or a possibility to uh, incept something like Bitcoin. Mm. So uh, it, it's completely mind blowing uh, what Bitcoin actually potentially might become. And, it. and it's uh, if you if you if we have Bitcoin like 2000 years in the future, we will be like the OGs of the OGs of the OGs <laughs> <laughs> and it will be documented. So it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, impossible to wholly get my head around what Bitcoin did to to me personally and to the world. I love it a lot. Um, I usually ask in the end of the podcast where people can find the guest. Uh, is there somewhere, because you have pseudonym here, uh, is there somewhere people can reach out to you or is the best way just leave a comment and you reply in this <laughs> in this YouTube uh, yeah, video? Yeah, yeah, I would like to keep it that way. Yeah, perfect. Then uh, if, if you have a question uh, for Norman, uh, just go in the YouTube comments and, and then yeah. you can okay. ask, uh, ask yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, everyone's welcome. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Then, yeah, uh, thank you for um, uh, being here today. Thank you for, for joining us. Also, thank you for everyone watching and listening for okay. joining us today. I'll be back, as always, tomorrow with another episode. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Robin. <laughs>